Hello, my name is Dr. Bonnie Key, and I'm the Interim Chief of Jack Cardio Oncology and the Founders Associate Professor of Cardio Oncology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Today, I am joined by Dr. Torbjorn Amund. He's Professor of Medicine at the University of Oslo and very well known as the PI of the Prada and Prada II studies, carefully examining cardioprotection with neurohormonal therapies in breast cancer patients. He is also senior author of a state-of-the-art review that we published in our March 2022 issue of Jack Cardio-Oncology entitled, The Role of Cardio Protection in Cancer Therapy Cardiotoxicity. Torbjorn, thank you so much for joining me today and for all the work that you, Siri, and Gita have done in leading the field, and particularly in this review in terms of synthesizing the most current evidence in cardio protection. Thank you, Bonnie, for those kind words. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. For our community, I was hoping you could summarize, in your view, what are the three most important take-home messages? I think one important point from our article is that although early trials in the field suggested a quite uh, a big uh, beneficial preventive effect of neurohormonal inhibitors, and the results of more recent randomized controlled uh, cardioprotective trials in patients receiving atracyclines and or her two targeted therapies have been more inconsistent. And in my mind, the evidence is not yet, and not yet there to support broadly administering cardioprotective prophylaxis, but should rather be based on risk assessment of individual patients. A second point, uh, which we sort of emphasize in the article, is that closer attention to reversible cardiac risk factors prior to potentially cardiotoxic cancer therapy may have a greater preventive effect than the choice of cardioprotective pharmacological treatment per se. And finally, interaction between oncologists and cardiologists should be part of the routine management for cancer patients who are at increased cardiovascular risk. Great, thank you so much. Three really important take home messages that are clinically applicable and can be applied in the care of our everyday patients. So just to drive home that point, when you're seeing your patient in clinic who's about to start anthracycline chemotherapy for breast cancer, what do you do in terms of cardioprotection therapy? For example, if the patient has no risk factors or if, let's say they do have hypertension, what do you practically do? No, I, I, of course, follow the patients very closely with regard to their hypertension and make sure that that is uh, very well controlled before uh, starting the, the, the cancer therapy with anthracyclines. Uh, I don't routinely, if it's very well controlled, I don't uh, routinely add uh, any other um, uh, cardioprotective therapies at that point, but I will, of course, follow the patients closely. And, if, and as you've said uh, in your first statement as one of the take home messages, in your view, the data as of yet in our field in cardio oncology would not suggest that there's uh, a blanket one size fits all cardio protection for all patients starting anthracyclines, correct? Yes, I don't think the current evidence uh, really support uh, a routine administration of cardio protective therapy upfront. Uh, Although there have been meta-analysis suggesting an overall effect of both beta blockers and ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, but uh, the readers should note that uh, these meta-analysis all suggest that there is marked heterogeneity between trials. And the more recent trials uh, tend to show a lower incident of cardiotoxicity than in the early studies and consequently also less benefit than observed in the earlier trials. And I think this may be due to different factors, including inclusion of lower risk patients in the more recent trials, as well as patients being at higher risk, uh, rather receiving an alternative and less cardiotoxic cancer therapies. But I also think an important point is that there is uh, now an increased awareness of this problem among oncologists. And I think uh, thanks to you and other pioneers in the cardio-oncology field, there is a better collaboration between oncologists and cardiologists or cardio-oncologists and more emphasis and better control of risk factors before initiating potentially cardiotoxic therapy. 
Thanks so much. Thanks for those really excellent points. And that meta-analysis, you're absolutely right, we published in our inaugural issue of Jack Crow Oncology. It was led by Muthu Vatiganathan, suggesting about a nearly 4% attenuation in EF declines with neurohormonal therapy, but emphasizing the heterogeneity of the studies and so forth, the need for larger studies. So in closing, what do you think are the greatest knowledge gaps as it relates to cardioprotection in our cancer patients and survivors? And really, where does the science need to go? And maybe even if you can, tell us a little bit about your own experiences now with the PRADA2 study. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you. I think there are many knowledge gaps, and one being that the long-term effects of neurohormonal blockade in patients at low or moderate risk still remains unclear. Uh, and as we already discussed the question of broadly administering uh, uh, therapy versus a targeting high risk patients uh, strategy still remains unresolved. We have data from many RCTs, but most of them are quite small and with relatively limited statistical power. And in particular, if we want, would like to look at patient subgroups. So I think we need uh, still a larger preferably multi-center trials, to get more definitive answers. And uh, also, we need to refine risk prediction uh, of our patients so that we can identify uh, those who are, who are more likely to benefit. There are data suggesting that more sensitive imaging methods, such as echocardiographic uh, global longitudinal strain, may improve risk prediction. And there are some biomarker studies that uh, suggests that biomarker measurements may be helpful. But again, the data is somewhat inconsistent and they don't explain sort of the, the, the variability in, in risk. So I think we need to do a better job on that. And when it comes to where the science needs to go, I think we have to evaluate novel cardioprotective interventions beyond neurohormonal antagonists, including therapies that more specifically target the, tar the cardiotoxic process and uh, then the neurohormonal antagonists, which I believe predominantly uh, uh, modulates the response to injury than uh, the cardiotoxic process per se. And uh, finally, I think that um, uh, most RCT evidence is based on studies with patients re receiving anthracyclines or HER2 targeted therapies. And with a number of new cancer therapies being developed and used, we will need new studies on how to prevent cardiovascular toxicity of those drugs. So I think a closer collaboration with clinical trialists running cancer therapy studies, for instance, uh, with perhaps cardioprotective substudies embedded within the cancer trial may be one way forward. Those are great points. Uh, absolutely. I firmly and strongly believe in risk-guided cardioprotection and hope to be able to improve upon uh, precision medicine in that way in terms of identifying those high-risk patients. And I really love what you said about targeting the mechanisms uh, in terms of the biologic perturbations in terms of why these uh, cardiotoxicities are occurring and target cardioprotective therapy according to mechanisms as well. Tell us a little bit about Prada too. And how's that going? Yes, thank you. Of course, running a randomized clinical trial, multi-center in the, in the era of COVID has not been uh, simple. So we are a little bit behind with, with regard to recruitment. Prada2 uh, is a randomized uh, four-center uh, trial in Norway involving four uh, university hospitals. And uh, in that study, we are, uh, we are evaluating the effect of um, sacubitril valsartan uh, as uh, in patients with uh, early uh, breast cancer receiving adjuvant therapy. And we are using um, cardiac MRI as the um, method to assess LV function, but also doing biomarker and echocardiographic uh, substudies. So uh, we are um, more than halfway <laughs> recruiting, and hopefully we will be able to, to uh, complete recruitment in 2022. And then there is an 18 months uh, follow-up period before the final assessment. So uh, the next couple of years will be very exciting. 
Certainly, I know the entire field is looking forward to the results of Prada 2. So thank you so much, Torben, for all of your excellent work, for the rigor that you bring to the field and the innovation in terms of your clinical trials. I know the field has greatly benefited from all of your science and work. So thank you. Thank you, Bonnie.